Welcome everyone to the session My Journey with IPM by Anand Bakma. We're glad Anand can join us today. So without further delay, so over to you, Anand. Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope you're able to hear me well. Okay, so thanks for joining this session. Um, did everyone attend the keynote? I thought it was fantastic. There's so many interesting uh, things to learn from from that uh, session, what Anne Marie was able to share. I've made a ton of notes <laughs> for myself. But let's talk now about what my journey with APM is and why is that journey important enough for me to share you know, with you. So I'll take you through a journey about this whole aspect of mine, uh, this experience of mine. I'll share the challenges that I've gone through, the pain that I have gone through uh, on this journey. But what was the outcome out of all of that? And that is where I think I'm hoping it will provide some inf uh, information, some ideas, some techniques that you could adopt in your own journey to get value in automation, in mobile automation with APM or any other tools for that matter. So a little bit more about me. You can connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter or X as it is called. I'm still not able to get used to calling it X, uh, but it is what it is. I have now been uh, in this space uh, for more than 25 years. And I started my journey in the professional uh, area of life in the testing field, but very quickly I graduated to start thinking about quality and I've played n number of different roles, whatever it could uh, take, whatever I could get to help build a quality product. Along the way, I also got an opportunity of you know, taste of open source, how it adds value. And then eventually I started contributing to open source as well in various different ways, uh, whether building my own test automation tools and solutions, or contributing in any small way to Selenium and APM as well, I do that. But since the past six years now, I've been uh, doing consulting. And just a couple of months ago, I changed my title officially to a software quality bartender. That is a very important uh, title for me because it truly represents what I think about quality. A bartender, what would uh, a bartender do? Based on the order that is placed, they would choose the right set of ingredients and make a drink of choice for the customer. Likewise, from a quality perspective, given there are so many different tools, technologies, practices in play uh, that are available, how can you choose the right combination of processes, tools, technologies, practices to get to the solution required for the organization. The thought process might really be the same, but the ingredients are going to change based on the context of the organization, the culture of the organization, skill sets on the team, type of product domain, and so many other factors as well. So that is what I do. I come up with solutions, approaches, strategies to help build the right type of solution, meet the objective, that customers. But enough about me. Let's come back to our topic about my journey uh, with APM. How did it start? What did I go through? And what are the learnings that I've had from this? So why mobile automation first? I hope this is actually very self-explanatory if you think about it. But here's some recent data from a digital usage perspective where we are now at a population of around 8.12 billion worldwide. And out of that population, we've got unique mobile phone subscribers of 5.68 billion. 5.45 billion are using the internet. And there are 
again, you'll find a ton of data related to this aspect. Point over here is there's a huge mobile phone usage around the world. More importantly, for the people who are using the mobile phones, you see the trend of how the growth is happening in terms of the smartphone usage itself. That itself has gone up tremendously. Year over year, that trend is keeping on increasing at a very, very good pace. What that means is, if we take an example of one of the benefits of this mobile technology, internet technology, online shopping activities. A lot of people in the room could potentially relate to this as well, including myself for that matter, that there's a huge percentage of people who are using smartphones, who are doing online shopping, using their devices, whether it is for groceries, electronics, or any type of activities does not matter. Now, this is from a shopping perspective. You can again find entertainment, OTT, uh, social media. There are so many different aspects where people are spending a lot of time on their phones. So it is very obvious that companies or product organizations need to start thinking about their product as a mobile first strategy instead of going a desktop first strategy. There are many companies who start off with that strategy and in some cases they don't even have a mobile or a website presence. It's very namesake presence. All functionality capability is available through a mobile uh, device. So it is obvious that we need to think as testers on the mobile testing space and how we can automate the mobile devices, our applications on mobile devices in a better way to ensure your functionality is going to work correctly. Your users are going to get the right value from your product. And this is where it comes down to how do we automate and this is where APM fits in. Why APM? First of all, open source. It is for me, it was a very natural transition from Selenium to APM because I've been using Selenium, Selenium WebDriver for a long time. Getting to mobile uh, automation was, uh, getting to APM was very seamless in that sense. Approach was similar. The technology behind the scenes is slightly different. That's the only change. And of course, the support that uh, APM has, and this is not just a support from what type of browsers, device, uh, devices um, will be able to automate, whether it's Android, iOS, or uh, tvOS, and so on. But it's also the support from the community, the com uh, committers who are so accessible, who uh, collaborate with people who are using the technology, using the tool sets to help provide the solutions for them, guide them how to get better at it. It is a very awesome experience just being part of that community where you have that much support uh, to continue doing what you need to. So APM was obvious that that's how I needed to start a, a start with for automation perspective in the first glimpse that I got into a uh, mobile automation. But it was painful for me. I'm going to be truthful about this. It was very painful because I'm used to doing browser-based automation or API-based automation. But mobile automation is in that sense a very different ball game. There is a steep learning curve that I encountered because instead of thinking about browsers, I now need to start thinking about Android as a separate operating system. In the Android ecosystem, what are the tools, technologies I need to be aware of from an automation perspective, testing and automation perspective? And this is where all the different SDK versions, command line tools, Android uh, command, ADB command line tools, and so on come into picture. And uh, real devices versus emulators, what are the differences really between them and what should be used for testing or not? Uh, you need to start thinking about that. This is from an understanding perspective, but if you really want to start automating, you need to understand what are the device capabilities as well. You need to think about the OS versions as well. What type of capabilities do you need to pass as part of your automation script to interact with the device correctly and control the device in a correct fashion. That is very interesting to uh, come about. Last bit, which I don't know how many people really think about, but you have to think about what the release process is going to be for that app. How does the app get built from a dev machine? How do you test it in various different environments? 
and how is it eventually going to be released via Play Store to the end users? And in that, what is the review and approval process? Oh, how much time does that take? What type of information is Play Store going to capture and give me in terms of insights of my app? You need to understand all of that aspects in detail to be able to test it effectively and prevent issues going to production. Of course, the release approach itself has stage release uh, releases that can be done to reduce the impact of something bad going out to all your users. So if you have stage releases, how do you do that? Now there is a different way how Play Store allows stage releases versus iOS. In Play Store, you can control, at least this used to be the case you know, when I worked on mobile app automation a couple of years ago, you were in complete control of what, how much percentage of a user base you want to release your application to. And uh, do you want to progress with that uh, rollout or do you want to stop it over there? You had the control for it. So these were the painful things for me to learn by experience while I was testing uh, over there, you know, the app, uh, figure out how this whole thing works and start thinking about the automation side of it. iOS was a completely different ball game. If Android was painful, I don't know what to describe iOS because in this case, We've got the complexities of Xcode. Again, if you're not familiar with that tech stack, it is going to be complex. For me, that was the case. I was not familiar with the Xcode tech stack. And that means the complete ecosystem around how software is built and released on the Mac OS or iPhones is a different thing. You have to think about if I have to use Xcode for creating simulators or using devices to do automation, I first need to start thinking about is my export version compatible with my OS version. The app signing process that might be there, the you know, differences between real device and simulators, which is very different from Android because of uh, different security constraints that uh, the Apple uh, ecosystem puts on the OS. That became a very challenging thing. And of course, at that point, so this I'm talking about eight, 10 years ago, to automate using uh, for iPhone devices, you have to you know, get the web driver agent configured correctly. And that was really painful at that time. You really had to struggle. And it was like, when you get it working, do not touch that machine, do not touch anything on that machine because you don't know if it breaks, how do you fix it again? Huge challenges uh, that were there at that point. Things have of course got way better now, very easy to use and set up. The release process again, as I mentioned for Play Store, it was different, for App Store it is different. Apple of course is more strict about the review and approval process. Sometimes it can take up to two to three days to get the approval for a release of your app. So you have to plan your release cycles accordingly based on if a feature is critical to be released to production on App Store on a particular date, you have to work backwards thinking, how much time is my approval process going to take? And then work backwards to see how do you need to develop and test to make sure you meet that date correct. Now the stage release process for App Store was a different thing than Play Store because in App Store, you cannot really control the rollout percentage. And once you start it, automatically it will do stage rollouts uh, if you choose to use that approach uh, over a week's time. And that again was the case earlier. I'm not really 100% sure what it is right now, but you could not control what percentage stage rollout you want to do. Uh, App Store controls that. You can pause it, or you let it roll out to 100%. So again, you have to understand the nuances of the different uh, distribution mechanisms and plan your releases accordingly. Now, this was a painful thing from a uh, Android and iOS perspective. For APM itself, it was uh, pretty challenging uh, when you get started over here, right? I'm talking about the APM 1.x days. How do you start and stop a APM server seamlessly? Because I don't, when I'm doing automation, I don't want any manual intervention in it, but I'm going to start my APM server manually and then I will run the script, for example. That is not automation. So how do you do everything programmatically in a non-intrusive way, manual intervention way? And you have to figure out the right combination of how APM server works. You have to understand that, how devices connect, you have to understand that. And based on that, you have to figure out uh, if things are working correctly or not. So for this, you also need to understand how to you know, configure and tune your logging mechanisms so that you can get understanding if certain things are not working, what is the information in the logs? And based on that, you can fix those challenges. Device management itself is very important now because now it's not that you are interacting with the device manually. 
or either it's an emulator, simulator, or a real device. You want your automation script to control the device, which means your test that you are automating needs to be able to understand, uh, get the right device information, do device cleanup, fetch the logs from the devices, uh, make sure the Wi-Fi connectivity is correct in the device because in certain applications, you need to be connected to certain types of Wi-Fi, for example, for the application to work. So you need to make sure that is correct. Uh, you might need to have geolocation set up correctly uh, to make the app work correctly and uh, respond accordingly uh, based on the context of your application. You need to understand how to set that up as well. And the last thing is about, do you have these devices connected locally to your laptop or it's there somewhere in the cloud? Again, the connectivity is going to matter. The ma management of devices, the capability, what these devices will be able to offer as part of your scripts is going to change based on where the devices are and what type of devices are the real versus emulated devices. So controlling all of this via APM is uh, feasible, of course, but you need to understand these things. And that was painful because you have to go through this learning process to figure out what is not working. Oh, this is another aspect that I need to think about. And you have to start understanding how to solve that challenge and come up with a solution for it accordingly. Last bit is from a connectivity perspective. How is the device really going to connect to your script or be available to your script? Is the device local in that case? Is it a real device? Is it connected you know, via USB cable? Or is it on a local uh, machine? What is the network set up over there? Or if it's in the cloud, how are you going to connect with it? What information you'll be able to uh, fetch from the device? You, uh, connectivity becomes an important aspect from APM. How will you manage that as part of your automated script? So these were some of the learning uh, challenges that were there when I started with the APM journey. But as you keep progressing uh, towards the goal, the challenges uh, come up uh, and from the challenges, you'll be able to come up with the solutions. So more specific challenges that I have uh, went through from an automation perspective, the first one was from a device management point of view. You have to think about how is your device is really going to be connected over here uh, or be available to your scripts. So you start small by saying, okay, I have one device uh, available in my script. And in that uh, device, How is it connecting with my laptop? Am I able to interact with it? Am I able to implement my script? You start off with that first. If not real device, then you would use emulator or simulator. Then you would also say the device is connected, but from an automation perspective, in order to run the scripts, do I need web driver agent uh, available over there? Or do I, uh, if it's a uh, emulator simulator, which is, uh, sorry, a real device, which is connected uh, to the machine, do I have good, robust connectivity, reliable connectivity over there with uh, that particular device? And for this, uh, it is very important. Uh, I had some very interesting experiences over here where this type of setup uh, we had, it seems straightforward, right? I've got, uh, in this case, eight devices connected. We have different USB switches, powered USB switches, but suddenly the devices used to lose connectivity or they used to fall down because the two-way tape was not strong enough to continue holding it for a long time, or the USB cable, because devices are continuously powered on, the USB cables used to go bad pretty quickly and have intermittent connectivity. Either way, that was a problem. And these were things that we kept facing uh, along the way while implementing this automation solution and tried to come up with unique different ways how to resolve these challenges. When it came to APM itself, I spoke about you know, starting and stopping the APM server. How do you really make that reliable? If the test is already running, make sure there's no existing APM server instance. Uh, if it is, you kill that off uh, because sometimes that, uh, the server used to go, the connection used to go stale, the test aborted in between or the app crashed and the cleanup did not happen correctly. So dynamic ports, all those aspects came into picture. How do you really manage that? Because the test ran first time in a non-intrusive way. But when I ran it again the next time, what is really going on with it? Why is it not running? Why is it saying port is already uh, used, for example? So this is where the logs again become very important to capture the logs automatically as part of your test execution and keep it uh, available in your execution per run, uh, separate the execution logs per uh, test run so that you have a history to look forward to and also 
you will be able to resolve the issues in a seamless fashion. Uh, the device management, uh, there are a lot of utilities that you can uh, build uh, using APM, leveraging APM uh, to get all this information automatically, connect to the right Wi-Fi, set the right geolocation, and proceed with the execution in the way that your script uh, really requires to test your application correctly. Also, uh, have the cloud management aspects uh, captured uh, correctly over there. Now, capturing screenshots is another challenge because on Android, it might work differently. iOS, it might work differently. There might be not just what you see on the screen, but you need to scroll and take full screen, uh, scroll and take full page screenshots as well. You need to build that type of capability into your automation framework. Again, leverage APM and figure out how to use that. But these are the different challenges, again, in different contexts that I encountered, which was not giving me the good value of automation. So I kept capturing all these challenges along the way. And uh, from these challenges uh, came the next steps, how do we action on it and create solutions. Running the tests is again a very important challenge that uh, you need to think about. And you need to have an understanding what is the objective, how do you want to run the test? Do you want to run the tests in parallel? Uh, so for example, I've got three types of devices. I've got 100 tests automated. Do I want to split these 300, uh, three, uh, the 100 tests across three devices? Or because the three devices are separate, I want to run the same 100 tests on each of these types of devices. So running the tests in parallel or running the same set of tests across different types of devices, you need to have that understanding what your application requirements are and accordingly, you need to make sure your framework is able to set it up in the correct fashion to run the test. Likewise, for CI versus local execution, you should be able to run the test against any device connected locally or from CI aspect as well. In CI, you might not have devices connected to your CI server or the CI agents. Where are the devices going to be? How is your script going to be completely automated to figure out where the devices are, pick up those devices correctly and proceed with the execution? So this is very important to understand from a CI point of view, uh, especially where are the devices uh, and how are you going to really connect to them to run the test in a seamless fashion. It's not just about connecting to the device and running the test. You also need to get the APK or the app from wherever it has been built, install it in the device, and then the test is going to run. So it's an additional step which our automation script needs to ke uh, keep in mind as well. So these were you know, some of the challenges. Of course, I've not listed all these challenges, uh, what I've encountered over time, but these are some of the high level challenges when you think about how your automation should be structured, how to get value from automation for mobile apps. But enough about challenges. Let's look at what are the different uh, interesting solutions that uh, we can build. And I'm going to share with you some examples what I've done in these past eight, 10 years from a mobile automation perspective and how you could also leverage the same solutions as well as build something similar or better on your own as well. The first thing is uh, I had built a Mad Lab. So this was when I was working at ViewClip many years ago, OTT application. And for that, uh, the application itself was pretty complex, right? So you have to understand the context of your application uh, based on which you are going to build, uh, come up with your solution. So the context over there was, the ecosystem was complex, Android, iOS, uh, desktop applications as well as more browser-based applications as well. Uh, how do you test effectively across the functionality across all of these different platforms? The platforms, uh, the app is also available in different regions, which means the same app is going to display different content, different user experience in different regions based on the language and the culture and what is uh, more uh, suitable for that type of audience. The app also had dynamic content. It had search capabilities. It had download capabilities. It had uh, offers and ads that uh, used to be uh, shown over there as well. So all of these aspects are going to be different in each of the regions based on the network provider that you're using as well. And that caused a huge problem of scale when it comes to executing and validations that need to happen from an automation perspective. One product, one experience, how do you really validate that in an effective fashion? This was the context and this was my first exposure to mobile automation 
in my career. And it started off with such complexity, setting up automation for this type of application. So understanding the context was very important. And based on this context, you have to think about what are the different experiments that you can do uh, to make sure uh, you can you get the right value and you have the right approach in place. So there are many experiments that I uh, we did, and these are things that work for us. We ran the test on emulators and very quickly found out that emulators are not going to work for this type of application where streaming is required. So emulators was gone. This was a good successful experiment. We ran it on emulators. It did not work. Uh, next, what else? We used cloud-based services. At that time, these were the options that were available for uh, device labs, uh, source labs, test object, device farm, P cloudy. Unfortunately, none of these work because again, for the geographic constraints that the application had and uh, the kind of capability required in those devices, the interactions required uh, for validation point of view, these device forms at that point did not provide the kind of capability required. So while we tried out everything, it did not work. We said, fine, we cannot do this using a device form. We have to do this on our own. So set up our own device lab. So these are all successful experiments. Successful experiment means we have proven it works or it doesn't, and we are able to go ahead. There were also some experiments that uh, did not really work for us very well, right? So I mentioned about emulators. So why did that experiment not work? We looked at the uh, streaming capabilities, the location-based capabilities. These are things that uh, did not meet our requirements from a testability point of view. So these were uh, the criteria we put forth uh, to determine the success or failures of the experiments. We also found out even though we are setting up a real device farm lab, certain types of devices are not automation friendly. They keep asking for a captcha or re-enabling developer options every 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That has to be done manually in order for automated scripts to run against that device. Those types of devices cannot work for automation. So these are again learnings that we had that certain types of devices, though we invested in them, no, it did not really work out. The other uh, thing uh, based on these experiments that we uh, came to a realization was the setup part of all this ecosystem is very challenging. How to implement the tests, how to run the tests, whether on local or in CI, the setup itself is quite cumbersome. It is quite challenging. And this again, keeping in context, this is about eight to 10 years ago. I'm doing a workshop tomorrow for building an automation framework for, uh, using APM2. Over there, we are going to look at aspects how to automate the whole process as well for the setup so that you don't have to do everything manually, which results in a different setup for every person on the team or in CI. So if anyone is interested, there is a workshop, full day workshop tomorrow to go through that aspect as well. But coming back to MADLAB, we automated the whole setup process, but the way you really start is you look at from my machine, how am I going to really run the tests? Connect the device, implement the test, look at the results. And if it works correctly for one, then how do you start scaling it up? And this is where from one device, we went to a couple of them to eight devices running from uh, connected to a Mac mini and the tests are running from that uh, particular OS. Eventually, because this became so successful Android and iOS, we were able to scale this up, built a special device lab at ViewClip where we could host up to 70 plus Android and iOS devices uh, at the same time connected to three or four Mac mini machines. And tests are running continuously via Jenkins at that point in time. And we are getting continuous feedback from a test automation. So this whole Mad Lab uh, that was built, mobile automation uh, device lab that was built was based out of necessity, based on something that was not available to be reused easily. And we had to come up with our own solution. Faced a lot of challenges along the way uh, in this uh, approach, because how do you really manage and maintain all these devices, connect with all of them, get the right information for all these devices connected together and uh, get the feedback from them, do the, uh, get the right types of reports, run the tests in parallel, uh, what type of additional validations can you do, whether it's analytics validation or validate the GPU rendering side of it, the uh, screen rendering, if that is working well or not because this aspect was very important. We used to get a uh, flag from Play Store and App Store if there are frozen frames that you see in your application and that end users see that and Play Store, App Store monitors those things. So based on that data, we started capturing and validating 
aspects of frozen frames as part of our automated test itself that gave us a lot of you know, very interesting capabilities and value adds as part of running the same test script. So we solved a lot of these types of challenges and there were many innovations that were done as part of this as well. Uh, whether you, how do you manage all the devices, do the setup, clean up out of that. And all of this is available open source. So though a lot of this might be outdated because with APM2, it has become easy. Device farms have become much more robust, scalable and rich in capabilities. Uh, so a lot of this might already be available out of the box. But if you are still having an in-house device lab set up for you know, various reasons, you can leverage this or reach out to me to understand how some of these innovative uh, innovations were done or some of these problems were solved in the in-house device labs to get value from automation. Okay, So from these challenges faced and the innovations uh, that were created, there were a lot of learnings that I came about in all this journey, right? So first of all, the blueprint is very important. You need to have a goal. What are you really aspiring towards? If you don't have a blueprint, if you don't have a vision where you need to go, you will not be able to iterate over, experiment, and learn along the way to implement the right solution, getting towards that goal. You will not be able to get to the goal immediately. It's a journey. But a blueprint is important to make sure the steps you're taking leads you to that journey. That is extremely important. The second you need to know what experiments you need to do or what POCs you need to do and how do you learn quickly from them if it is going to work well for you or not. So knowing the objective of an experiment is very important and knowing the pass-fail criteria for each experiment is extremely important to say, how do you proceed? And this whole Mad Lab experience was an experiment in that fashion because we knew what we want to achieve from an automation perspective for that type of application. We created a path how to get there. We learned along the way and we eventually built a lab which uh, had 70 plus devices that uh, solved that problem or helped solve that problem. As I uh, heard till last year, the same setup that uh, we had done about say eight years ago is still working. Of course, it has evolved over time, but it is still working. It is still adding value. And that is a good, satisfying feeling about the solution that you've created from the experiences that you have learned. Okay. So this was about Mad Lab. There is another very interesting thing that I came across uh, that I had to build as a solution. Uh, and that is called TestWiz. It's a test automation framework that we built to automate real user scenarios. Now, in this case, again, the uh, use case was very different. The motivation is something that you need to understand uh, before you build a solution, is there something available offhand or uh, off the shelf that can be used, whether open source, free or commercial, doesn't matter, build, buy, reuse, whatever works to solve your problem in the permit of, in the context of your organization, uh, security, and of course, what you try to achieve from automation perspective. If you can find something uh, available and use it, that's best because then you can focus on implementing your test to get the value of automation. But if not, then you have to build your own solution. And this is what we did with TestWiz as an open source uh, solution for automation. So what was the motivation for creating uh, TestWiz? In TestWiz, the motivation was first, the use case was we have collaborative ways of working in uh, any application, like this particular uh, conference, right? I'm presenting from Zoom but everyone has joined from the browser or from their mobile devices as well. You are able to, uh, the moderator is able to interact uh, with me via Zoom. Participants are able to send chat messages from the browser, which is coming into Zoom. Very different, interesting use cases. But how do you really automate these types of use cases? So this is where uh, the use case uh, to summarize or generalize was, how do you automate collaborations and interactions between different personas and users? You could be a single user on different platforms. One person could have joined through different channels to the same meeting and you can interact, or you could have multi-users on different platforms, the way you are in this particular uh, session, different uh, applications connected to the same session, right? Or you could have a scenario where there are different applications, different uh, personas, and they are interacting with each other. So an example of uh, e-commerce site, right? Where you place an order from one app or from the browser, 
the order is going to the backend system. It goes to the warehouse. Warehouse is going to collect your items, send it to the local delivery station. The delivery person picks up the items, comes and delivers to you. And on their phone, they are marking it, saying that the order has been delivered. So many different applications in place, coordination is happening. How do you automate that end-to-end -end scenario to see if that interaction is working well? That is real motivation for creating test ways. How can you automate and simulate scenarios related with multi-personas, multiple users, multiple apps, multiple platforms as part of a single orchestration? This is where uh, TestWiz uh, comes into picture where it's able to handle uh, as part of the same test orchestration, how to do the automation across for these types of applications and use cases. Again, TestWiz is open source. So if you want to use it uh, for testing real user scenarios, you could simply clone the repo or uh, use TestWiz as a library. There's a getting started with TestWiz repo and you can just get started implementing your test without having to reinvent the wheel rebuild a framework with all the capabilities that typical automation frameworks need. Now, along with this uh, handling multiple devices for the same uh, test, the implementation of uh, the use cases, we also have visual validation uh, capability as part of uh, TestWiz, and uh, we use Apply tools for uh, this capability. And you'll be able to get AI-powered visual validations as part of your executions as well. And this is a great learning for me because over here, I have not reinvented the wheel. I've taken Selenium WebDriver for web. I've taken APM for uh, native apps and uh, Windows desktop. I've taken rest assured type of libraries for API test uh, automation. But I've collaborated, I've orchestrated all the device management, browser management, API management, and added a lot of capability in terms of screenshots, reports, uh, visual validation, uh, everything packaged together so that if I have to start automation on any team going forward, I simply use this as a repository and focus on validating my product quality instead of focusing on building a framework. I would not have done this if there was an existing capability in any tool that allows me to do the real user validations. Because it was not there, I had to rebuild. So you have to really think strongly about build versus buy versus reuse and how to optimize it for your context. That is a very important aspect to keep in mind over here. So this was the motivation of for creating uh, TestWiz and the features that uh, we had uh, built uh, for this uh, aspect. Now the next thing is how can it uh, how can TestWiz really simplify and enhance the uh, test? This is where the value proposition starts coming in, right? Not just the features and capability by specifying it in Gherkin simple BDD uh, syntax with. TestWiz uh, capabilities that were added. You can specify using different annotations which platform the test works on. You can specify if it's multi-user scenarios, who is doing the action and where the action is happening on which platform. You could also say on uh, they could be coming from different platforms, different personas from different platforms. That would also be uh, possible to be done using TestWiz. And these tests would run across browsers, devices based on your configuration that you have. Uh, here's an example from a multi-user, multi-app scenario where, in this case, the host is coming from using the latest version of the app on Android. The first guest is also coming on Android, but using an older version of the app. The third guest, uh, second guest is joining the same meeting from the browser and part of being part of the same meeting. And that's how the interaction is able to proceed and be validated as well. So these are a very, uh, very important way of how the intent is validated, intent is made explicit, and you're talking about the business language where this becomes your self-executing documentation of your product functionality. Now, the way the implementation would happen, CI is our most important source of truth if of product quality. So you would want to have over there uh, how your test is run from local uh, or it is run from CI. You need the same approach for execution uh, that is going to remove the variables and remove chances of failures that is happening. So uh, TestWiz offers this capability to run it from local or run it from CI, and it takes the same path. It integrates with Specmatic for uh, uh, intelligent stub server. It creates execution reports on Apply tools, reportportal.io. It generates feature coverage reports as well. A very powerful and easy way to, uh, to run the test itself. 
there is ai capability as i mentioned earlier visual validation using ai uh, that would be possible and then there is also aspects of uh, ai powered uh, reporting server to take quick decisions for root cause analysis and auto analysis of the failures creating intelligent dashboards for getting a concise view of how your tests are executing this is an example of a feature coverage where as part of a test execution you will be able to see what is the capability of features that your uh, tests have covered so far code coverage does not help at end to end test level but at an end to end test level you need to think about a feature coverage so test which generates a feature coverage reports as well lastly the most Im uh, important capability which again i find it lacking in uh, i found it lacking in most automation solutions which is what has been built in test Swiss, is a concept of a hard gate so you need to be in control if a test is supposed to pass it is always passing if it is failing it's for a product issue or a test out of sync issue with your application either way passing test should always pass and known failing test should always fail till they are explicitly fixed and that is the hard gate that you can rely on to know if your automation is really deterministic or not uh, so this is another capability that test was a uh, provides for you to use and this is something that is very valuable to the teams who are using automation as a pure gate to say if everything is fine or not. Okay. Uh, many other capabilities uh, uh, will not go through that uh, right now in interest of time. The point over here is you need to think about what is a problem statement, what is the objective, and how can you come up with solutions that can be uh, that can overcome the challenges and help achieve the objectives. I have shared with you some uh, capabilities what I have built to implement uh, or overcome some of those challenges. And all of these capabilities that I have uh, built are available open source or available from my GitHub uh, repos uh, for you to leverage as well. Upgrading uh, from APM 1 to APM 2 was also a challenge because uh, that progression, uh, it was a little uh, in flux, uh, but now it is very stable. But along the way, also contributed to another awesome library, uh, which uh, Sai Krishna and uh, Srinivas and Sekar, they have uh, built called APM test distribution, contributed to that to add Cucumber JVM support uh, to that framework. That is what, again, TestWiz uses internally, which takes care of the device management and capabilities as well. Along with this, many other scripts I have implemented to help remove the pain of doing manual setup, whether it's setting up a machine. If I get a new Mac, how do I set it up with all the software? I have a script. I'm just going to you know, get it as a gist from my GitHub, run that script, it will set up all the software automatically for me. Likewise, for Android test automation setup and execution environment, I have a script available for Mac and uh, uh, Linux, but you can very easily using chat GPT, say, okay, create a Windows script uh, for this and give it to me, and you can do the same for Windows as well. In case if you're not using test suite and you're using report portal, you can directly take the J units and upload it to report portal to see, uh, get the capabilities of report portal. So that is also available as a script from GitHub. You can uh, make use out of that. Likewise, there are various other uh, utilities that I have built that you can take value from as well. Even if you don't, I know I'll be able to reuse this in various different contexts going in the future. So the main thing for me, the motivation for me has been, how can I reduce the pain for myself first? How do I avoid reinventing the wheel every different context that I go to? Because certain utilities capabilities are required regardless where you are. And that is very important. So let's summarize the learnings. And this again ties uh, well uh, with what Anne-Marie shared in her keynote as well. First, you have to keep an open mind, embrace the fear, accept the fear, embrace the unknown, keep an open mind and learn. Experiment with focused objectives, learn on your own, learn from people around you. You don't need to reinvent the wheel, but at some point in time, doing the experiment yourself helps so that your learning is more valuable compared to just reading about what others have done. And lastly, the way I'm uh, doing this right now, share your learnings with others. This will help others think about if they can reuse your solution or if they can get inspired to create a different unique solution for themselves or make your solution better itself. So with that, I'm going to pause now. Thank you again. I don't know if we, uh, see if we have time for questions. I do see there are two questions over here uh if you don't mind we can take that quickly thank you anand thank you for sharing your experience yes we do have questions and uh, the session has not ended automatically so maybe you can take the sure. questions from q a and 
there are also hands raised but unfortunately we won't be able to take that please join this uh, hangout section correct after the q and a then we will continue there anand will be available there so yep. go on I'll anand there on the hangout table as well yep. uh, but before we get there uh, let's quickly go through these questions ashish is asking what are the pros and cons for using simulator versus real device uh, pros and cons ashish are very contextual to the application under test for a ott type application where there's going to be streaming of videos and all emulators simulators might not give the right type of experience over there if it's just static screens of sorts of dynamic data not moving content then potentially emulators simulators can be a great value add uh, as a first starting point instead of using a real device so i hope that gives you some light around real devices or emulators uh, and you can we can talk more about that on the hangout table